All right, so today we're going to be talking about ABGs, and ABGs get a lot of people really nervous and really scared, but I will promise you after this lecture, you will have a much better understanding of them, and they will be much easier for you to understand. So when we're talking about ABGs, there's really one number that we're really worried about, and it's the pH. So for our purposes, we've used 7.45 and 7.35. That can vary depending on what is going on in your uh, facility. But those are the numbers we're going to use today. And then to get these numbers now, there's a lot of mechanisms that happen. There's the buffer system, which is an immediate system. And I like to think of these guys as sponges floating around the body that absorb or give off depending on what they need. Then you have the respiratory system. And this system can start working within minutes. So if you get someone in trouble, this is the system that's going to kick in really quick to get them taken care of. And then last, there's the renal system. And in this renal system, it can take up to 24 hours for this system to kick in. So if somebody's having an acute event, this system is usually the slower one and doesn't really help us until we've gotten outside of that 24 hours. Other numbers that we like to know are, that make our pH are our CO2, which is our acid, and we're gonna go with 35 to 45 as the number that we would see with that one and their HCO3 which is our base and this we're going to go with 22 to 26. Uh, these numbers together uh, will make up whatever your pH is all right because like I said your CO2 this is your acid and this is your bicarb or your base. All right, so when we're talking about ABGs, the main number that we talked about is that pH, which is so important and vital to life. Um, when we become alkalotic, our number, our pH, goes above 7.45. And if we're acidotic, our pH goes below 7.35. This is really important because for our cells to function, they really need to be in that pH range. When we're going to use this grid to help us understand this, on this side of it, we're going to talk about respiratory and how that affects it and impacts it. And on the other side of this grid, we're going to talk about the metabolic um, impacts that come into our pH. We'll start with respiratory because it's actually probably the easiest one, especially respiratory alkalosis. This is when our pH would go above 7.45 and our CO2, our acid, would drop because we're losing CO2 somehow. So our CO2 would go below 35, which is what we're using for the normal range of that one, and it would go below CO2. The biggest culprit of this is hyperventilation. Now, there are times when we hyperventilate people on the ventilator for certain reasons because of injuries and that kind of stuff, but most of the time we don't. Um, so this is gonna be somebody who might be having an anxiety attack or it might be somebody who maybe is in labor and having a baby, or it could be a kiddo that's upset and throwing a fit and they hyperventilate. Um, they're blowing off that CO2. Quick and easy fixes for this are if you happen to carry a paper bag, I wouldn't recommend a plastic one, but a paper bag that they can blow into um, to help rebreathe in that CO2, um, that would help them a lot. But most people don't carry paper bags anymore, but we all have hands. So if we cup our hands uh, over their mouth or have them cup their hands over their mouth, that will help them breathe that CO2 back in. We do have to figure out what it is um, that's causing them to hyperventilate and probably fix that cause. But until we do that, um, this the paper bag or the hands method helps them at least breathe in that CO2 to maintain um, their acid base balance. The nice thing about this, or um, an interesting thing, is most people aren't going to die from um, respiratory alkalosis because once you get to a certain point of one of lack of oxygen and two that CO2 being out of balance, the person's just going to pass out, and they're going to um, their body's going to correct itself. And once that body corrects itself, then um, they're going to wake up, probably have a really bad headache, but they're going to be okay. 
When we talk about um, respiratory acidosis, this one becomes a much bigger problem because the things are um, more uh, can be more complicated and cause death uh, overall. So this is an increase of CO2. Remember that CO2 is an acid, so it's causing us to become acidotic. Things and it would be hypoventilation. All right. So this is somebody who is not getting enough. Um, ox uh, oxygen and CO2 exchange. They're trapping. Um, big one for this one is our COPD patients. Um, a lot of our overdoses come in with these kinds of problems, either from alcohol or drugs, depending on the drug they took. But the opiates right now are the big culprit uh, that we see a lot of people coming in from respiratory acidosis. The problem here is if we don't fix this person, there is no autocorrect and the patient will end up dying because they are hypoventilated and so acidotic um, that they will end up dying from this condition. So big things here is we need to get them ventilating. So this is the person that, like the kid that comes in that's too drunk to breathe, they come in in respiratory acidosis because they've been hypoventilating. Um, we need to put them on a ventilator and get them um, breathing. And, and then once they the drug is passed, the system, then they wake up and they're fine. Unfortunately, with our COPD people, because it's a chronic illness, they have um, normally out of they have normal abnormal numbers in their CO2s. But even they eventually will get to a point where that CO2 builds up, and um, either they need to be on a ventilator, which I think most of them would choose not to be, um, and then or they will pass away from their disease process. When we come over to the metabolic side, it's not nearly as cut and dry. Um, when we talk about metabolic alkalosis, this is going to be our people that have too much base. So their HCO3 is climbing for some reason, and or they're losing their acids. They're losing the CO2s. They're losing that balance for something's going on that's making them lose that, which then causes the shift of the base to be higher. Things that cause this are our little ladies that like their tums um, and their antacids and they like to pop them like candy. We see some people in metabolic alkalosis for that because what's in tums? Bicarb and they're eating all that and um, neutralizing their acid and causing a shift in that. The other thing that can cause this is vomiting. So if somebody is, um, you know, we're not talking like a two or three days of vomiting. We're talking somebody who's maybe bulimic and is vomiting all the time or somebody who doesn't um, have the nutritional ability, has some sort of stomach issue or stomach issues and they vomit frequently. Um, so this can become a problem. Eventually, we see some mental status changes with these patients. Um, they can go into convulsions um, and they can have seizures and pass away from a metabolic alkalosis. Again, not something that we commonly see, but it is something that we can see. Another one that's a little bit more on the, what we see is people that um, go into metabolic acidosis. And these patients, they're losing their bicarb, which is their base, okay? Or they're gaining their acid for some reason, all right? So they, they again, are throwing their system out of whack. One um, person or group of people, um, unfortunately, are diabetics that um, go into DKA because that breakdown of fats increases the keto acids. Um, it causes them to go into metabolic acidosis. Another group, um, if we've got vomiting that does metabolic alkalosis, then our patients that have diarrhea go into um, can go into metabolic acidosis but again it's not a person that you know had the 24-hour GI bug um, you know this is the person that has Crohn's or ulcerative colitis and is constantly diarrhea or irritable bowels and um, having constant chronic diarrhea issues they can be in metabolic acidosis another group that's in this is people with renal failure because that renal system can't fix it so these patients have a lot of problems. Again, this they go and have weakness, they can have lethargy, um, confusion, and then eventually coma and death if we don't find ways of fixing it. Pretty easy to fix this. Um, most of the time we've got to fix that um, 
that DKA or we got to get them out of DKA, give them their insulin and potassium and fluids and that kind of stuff. Our diarrhea, we got to figure out why they're having diarrhea, why they're losing. And then our renal failure patients, a lot of times we need to get them on dialysis and get their, get that ability to take care of it. So if we fix the problem, we fix the acid base balance. All right, so let's go through an example of each one of these. So if we have a patient that has a pH of 7.52 and their CO2 is 22 and their uh, bicarb is 25, we know that we are alkalotic because our pH immediately tells us that, but then which one is out of balance, it's going to be our CO2. So this is going to be our friend who is hyperventilating um, because they saw a spider and they're, they're breathing and just puffing, poofing it all out. And they don't feel good and they're starting to get a headache and they're just keep on puffing and puffing and pushing it out. So one, we probably need to get the spider away if that's what they saw and scared them, or we need to give them that paper bag, or again, ask them to cup their hands over themselves. The next number we're gonna work on is 7.20. So we've got a pH of 7.20, a CO2 of 68, and we've got a bicarb of 24. All right, we know immediately that this is acidosis because of our low pH. And then which number is out of range? It's our CO2, again, is elevated. So we know that this is a respiratory acidosis. So this is our friend who uh, was out drinking and partying and had way too many drugs. And now they seem to be minimally responsive and not really breathing um, and they're hypoventilating. The next one we're going to use is uh, we have a pH of 7.19, we've got a CO2 of 38, and then we have a bicarb of 18, which we know immediately, acidotic, because we're 7.19. Our CO2 is okay, but our bicarb is really low. So what's going on here? Well, this is our friend that's come in, and they're, they're in um, metabolic acidosis. They uh, have been decided it's a 16 year old who decided they didn't want to be a diabetic anymore and so um, they thought well I'm just not going to take any more of my insulin shots because I just I don't want to be diabetic anymore and that happens we see that quite a bit with t especially teenagers they just don't really want to have diabetes so then their blood sugar skyrocket into this you know six to eight hundreds even more if you get really bad um, and their uh, body starts breaking down the fats which then increases their acids and then we get the messed up systems so making sure that we're paying attention um, to what's going on with our patient again not feeling good probably not responding a whole lot and something we need to pay attention to uh, our last one is 7.51 there uh, for pH their CO2 is 40 and their bicarb is 30 so definitely know that this is an alkalotic because we're above that pH range um, their bike their CO2 is okay but their bicarb is climbing and what's going on oh this is our little lady who um, carries Tums in her purse and she just loves them and so she just keeps eating them and they're in her purse all the time um, and she just thinks well you know the doctor said she needed a calcium supplement so she's just always carrying them in there um, so again need to definitely do some patient education probably tell her not to take so many tums um, and we need to to fix that problem so hopefully this gave you a kind of an idea of each of the patients that we might see in some of these acid base balances so to review our numbers one more time we've got our ph of 7.35 to 7.45 we have our CO2 of 35 to 45, our HCO3 or bicarb of 22 to 26. And the one number I didn't really go over is our PaO2, 
in which this is our oxygenation. And so this is the system that lets us know if our oxygen's even getting through or if we've got other problems going on. So sometimes you'll see that number in the mix as well. And this is just like our oxygen attached to our hemoglobins. And I mean, while really, really important and definitely a priority and one reason we want these acid-base balances to be on there, when we're figuring them out, that's not the number we necessarily look at. This is the number we look at. Are they adequately oxygenating? Um, and if they are not, then we've got to figure out uh, some other, we got to figure out to fix this problem quickly. So, and then I did not go into compensations, but know that the body never just lets a number just sit there. Um, it is constantly going to be trying to balance these numbers. And so um, it has processes in there to balance it. But this is just to get you started and understanding why pHs happen and why they start to get altered. But definitely know that when um, something else happens, that there is a compensation factor and the body's not going to just let it sit there. Um, it's going to try and fix itself because the body wants to survive. So know that there are compensations out there, but this is a start of understanding ABGs and getting keeping it pretty simple.